My name is Jason Kelty. This is my testimony. I grew up celebrating Christmas and Easter, but never went to church or read the Bible. I went through the public school system and watched a lot of TV, including shows like Cosmos and Nova. By my mid-twenties, I was an atheist. I saw no evidence of anything supernatural and believed everything I was taught in my science classes was proven fact. I was extremely selfish, profane, a pothead, a thief, a liar, a cheater, and already buried in debt. I was very outspoken as an atheist. I would say, thank Darwin, instead of thank God. And when other people said thank God, I would rudely say, who? I even remember debating my friends once if God exists, and I felt I creamed them because they didn't know how to defend their faith. In 1994, I had a friend who claimed to be a born-again Christian. He wanted to show off his car stereo and played a Christian song I'd never heard before. The song was called Big Bang, and the lyrics were denouncing evolution. This was honestly the first time I'd ever heard someone claim Darwinism wasn't true. I just thought it was crazy at the time, but that planted a seed in me. In January of 2001, at age 29, a friend brought me a videotape to watch. It was an evangelist named Kent Hovind, and he spoke about evolution, dinosaurs, Noah's flood, and the Bible. After I read the back of the videotape box, I told him, I'm going to pick this thing apart. But as I watched it, I couldn't refute anything he said. He brought me the rest of the videotapes. There were seven total. These tapes totally destroyed my belief in atheism. I still didn't believe in Jesus or the Bible, but I certainly believed a creator existed. The seminar scientifically proved three main things to me. The earth and universe can't be billions of years old. Darwinian evolution is scientifically impossible. And Noah's flood really happened. Roughly around that same time, I became addicted to a TV show called Crossing Over with John Edward, a psychic medium who could supposedly communicate with dead people and tell people in his audience things that only the dead person could possibly have known. I could tell these people weren't acting. Something supernatural was going on. I then studied the various world religions, seeking for who the Creator was. The only religions that matched up with all the scientific data from the seminar was Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. None of the others had anything to do with a creator or a global flood. After researching Islam and being a little biased because of 9-11, I quickly dismissed it as being the truth. And the only real difference between Judaism and Christianity was if Jesus was the Messiah or not. As my life was crashing around me due to a divorce, debt, alcohol, and weed, I finally cried out for God to help me and save me in November of 2003. I said a sinner's prayer along with a guy on TV and then proceeded to pray out loud for over an hour. From that moment on, my life began changing drastically. The first obvious change was how I spoke. I had no desire to use profanity anymore. I used the Lord's name in vain once loudly over a microphone and got hit with a conviction in my conscience that I'll never forget. I've never used the Lord's name in vain ever since. Also, my desires to drink and smoke went away too. All I wanted to do now was learn about God and the Bible and go to church. I literally spent eight or more hours every day listening to sermons and watching videos from the internet. I couldn't get enough. God put a hunger for his word in my heart that was just insatiable, and it's never gone away. One of the things I learned from listening to those recordings was about Bible codes and fulfilled prophecies. The statistical odds of these things happening by chance are impossible. It was this kind of information that finally clinched it for me. The Bible was definitely the inspired word of God. There was no doubt in my mind anymore. I started reading the Bible on a daily devotional schedule in April of 2004, and I've never stopped. I was playing music professionally in a rock band when all of this was happening. After my conversion, I didn't want to be working in bars anymore, so I asked to be replaced. 
I didn't want to just quit because my bandmates depended on me for their income too. I said, when Jesus wants me out, he'll get me out. It took them several months to find someone, but eventually Jesus sent a one-armed keyboard player, who was still better than me, to take my place. It turns out that man was also a Christian, and soon quit to join the Christian parody band, Apologetics. God's providence is awesome. On the night of my last gig, after I packed up all my gear, I led my first person to Christ in the parking lot. I was going to a church close to home. I enjoyed the fellowship with other believers, but I was noticing differences in what they were teaching and what the Bible literally says. It really started with their teaching on an imminent rapture, but the biggest red flag for me was when I was taking a class on how to interpret the Bible, and one of their criteria was dispensational truth. When I asked what that meant, I wasn't given a clear answer. After studying what dispensationalism is and where it came from, and I moved to the other side of town, I stopped going to that church in early 2008. I thought I'd find a better church, but I never did. Every church I visited was apostate in some way, and they were all dispensational. Since that time, I've put a lot more of my attention into the meat of God's Word. I'm extremely knowledgeable on young earth creationism because that's how my conversion began. I've also come to believe that the King James Version of the Bible is the only trustworthy English translation. I'm also very educated in eschatology, the study of Jesus' second coming, because of dispensationalism. I believe a very large global earthquake is in our near future. I have also experienced and believe in the power of the name Jesus Christ to heal and to cast demons out of people. I've prayed over people to be healed. I've had demons cast out of me, and I've cast demons out of other people. My sole desire in life now is to teach others the truth about where we really come from and where we're really going. Praise God for His Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hey folks, we're going to do a very quick Bible study, and I'm also going to prove to you uh, why atheism is confused and it contradicts itself badly. I had another atheist uh, email me and another one leaving a comment on my channel here, and they're leaving atheism. They become a Christian. Thanks for all your great info. You have made my move from... It's not pulling up right. You have made my move from atheism to Christianity a much easier move. Thank you, sir. That's what they say. And I got a lot of emails like that. Also, don't forget to click, click below here, and you can go see some of the nonsense of evolution, uh, some of the lies that the scientists have told that have now been proven lies, uh, the hoax, <laughs> the hoaxes of evolution. You got to see that right below here. But let's get back to this. Atheism is confused, and it contradicts itself badly. Um, I have asked atheists this question. I said, does this claim that it's possible for God to exist contradict the claim it is possible for God to exist? And they say, yes, it does contradict itself. But this is exactly what atheism says. Both of these are claims made within atheism. Now, I've read the Bible, and in Christianity, the claim is, is that God exists. There's no contradiction. Atheism, however, contradicts itself. Both of these dudes here, you got two guys that are atheists, both can't be right. We would all agree on that. Can it be possible that every Christian is right that claims God exists? Of course it can be possible. Can it be possible that all the atheists are right? It cannot be possible because they're claiming two different things within atheism. It can't be possible for God to exist in reality and also impossible for God to exist in reality. Either God exists or he doesn't. Therefore, atheism by default automatically is proven wrong because it contradicts itself. This is a logical fallacy. Christianity claims Satan exists. Atheism, again, contradicts itself. It says it's impossible for Satan to exist, yet atheism also claims it is possible for Satan to exist. Talk to 50 atheists, they'll say that. They'll, half of them will say that, About the other half will say that. But in Christianity... Satan exists. 
Jesus is the Son of God. In order to be a Christian, Christianity, you believe Jesus is the Son of God. It clearly makes that claim. But in atheism, it contradicts itself once again. It says it's impossible for Jesus to be the Son of God. We hear atheists all the time saying that. However, we also hear atheists saying it is possible for Jesus to be the Son of God, thus proving atheism is confused and contradicts itself badly. The Bible uh, clearly... Hold on a second. I clicked the links here. Okay. Here we go. The Bible clearly says that man is a sinner. It clearly says that. Uh, however, uh, if you talk to atheist and the atheism position is that it's impossible that man is a sinner, yet you'll have other atheists that are also believing atheism is true, and they're saying, no, it's, it is possible that man is a sinner. Atheism, again, very confused, and it contradicts itself badly. Now, I'm going to uh, give you the, uh, the atheist side real quick uh, before I'm done. Is there proof and evidence that Christianity is true? There is. You're going to see an annotation up here and an annotation on the bottom. You should watch both of those videos. Science, history, archaeological proof, extra-biblical proof, uh, so much proof. But is there proof and evidence that atheism is true? No. In fact, science even contradicts atheism. Um, is there pr science proving atheism is wrong? Yes. Is there science proving the Bible is wrong? No. Now I ask you, which side contradicts itself more? It is clearer that atheism fails. Which side seems confused? It is clear that atheism is confused. Which side is antichrist? It is clear that atheism is antichrist. Now let's get to this Bible study. I'm going to read this fast. If what Jesus said is true, then atheist, their father, is Satan. If what Jesus said is true, we cannot deny that the atheist father is Satan. And a lot of atheists have never read the Bible, uh, but we're going to talk about this. Not only is the atheist father Satan, but atheists are promoting slavery. So let's talk about that. Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And he's talking to people out in front of the temple. And watch what he says here. Uh, he says, and go to John 8 and read this all the way through. Notice Jesus says, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. But that's not what atheists believe. Remember, they're conflicted and confused about that. Jesus is not confused. Jesus is taking the side of Christianity here. And Jesus is saying that you will die in your sins. He's telling us. And he says, For if you believe not that I am he, Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah, you shall die in your sins. Now, check this out. This is amazing. Jesus actually says to these people and these people were very much the personality of humanist atheists they thought however they were uh, just fine I would even go as far to say if you ask most biblical scholars they would say that the atheists of our modern time are not as moral and good quote unquote as these people Jesus is talking to but look what Jesus says to them. And if Jesus is telling the people this, imagine what he would say to the humanist atheist today. Here he goes. He calls them slaves to their sin. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever committeth sin is a slave of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Now, <laughs> this is amazing. He says, if you continue my word, then you are my, my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But he says, if you were, Ab uh, I'm sorry, they said, Abraham is our father. And they're basically saying, we're not slaves. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me. A man that has told you the truth, which I've heard of God, this did not Abraham. In other words, Abraham's I'm greater than Abraham is what he's saying. 
Now watch closely here. He says, you do the deeds of your father. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So they're basically claiming they're good with God, right? These people, if you compare the people that Jesus are talking to in the Bible here to the new atheist of the year 2011, these people obviously were not even as bad uh, as the new atheist of 2011. But look what Jesus says to these people. He says, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? In other words, they're not paying attention to him. Look very closely. I want everyone to read. Go look up John 8, 44. What I'm about to tell you should scare the hell out of every atheist that's watching this video. And everyone that is anti-Christ. Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. Let's read that again. This is sweet, gentle, loving, honest, sincere Jesus saying this. You are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. In other words, that's his nature, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, here's it, here's the truth. This is everything that Jesus said right here. Jesus said all those things. Jesus never said those things. He says, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? In other words, he's like, okay, what have I done wrong? I haven't sinned. And he says, and if I say the truth, why don't you believe me? He that is of God heareth the good words. You therefore hear them not. Here it is, guys, because you are not of God. I'm telling you guys, if you're thinking this way, Jesus would say your father is Satan. I'm telling you, read the scripture, go to John 8, um, 44, and these people, quite frankly, I, in my opinion, were not as bad as the modern atheists of today's time. Now, let me wrap this video up. You know, when I go through this with atheists, they'll admit, they'll say, you know, Shock, I do admit that atheism contradicts itself, and it contradicts itself badly. They admit it. But they say, but shock, you know, we're always in search of truth and we'll find it. You know, science is going to find it. And, and they tell me it's like a mountain that we all must climb, you know. And they'll say, and one day, shock, you know, we'll find the truth. One day we'll get to the top of the mountain and we'll know the truth. But right now, nobody knows what truth is, even though Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus claimed all those things were true right there. Well... What I would say, you guys, as an ex-atheist that realize atheism is a bunch of crapola, to the people that are searching for truth, you're going to find that when you finally do your searching and research and you look at science, and by the way, click the annotations that pop up and click below this video. I'll put some links there that prove uh, science proves atheism is confused and contradicts itself badly. But you guys are going to find, those of you that are saying, oh, we're climbing this mountain of truth and stuff. Well, look, I've been to the mountaintop, guys. I've already done the research. It is obvious this can't be true. By default, this for sure can't be true. Because both of those claims can't be right. We all agree on that. This, however, can be true. It's not contradicting itself. This is. But those of you that are saying... One day we're going to climb this mountain of truth and we'll finally finish climbing it. And what you guys are going to find is as you climb this mountain of truth like I have, and I've looked at atheism, I've looked at the science that totally proves Christianity is true, it totally proves that atheism is not true. 
what you guys are going to find, those of you that are looking for truth, and also when you read the Bible, by the way, that when you actually get to the top of the mountain, you're going to find that the Christians were already there. And they're going to say, hey, what took you so long? So I've been to the mountaintop. Like one of my uh, uh, favorite men of history is that Martin Luther King Jr. He said, I've been to the mountaintop. And here's the thing, guys. There's no possible way all this can be true. It's impossible. It even contradicts itself. Therefore, by default, this can't be trusted. At best, we know that this is a lie. And at least we know that it is confused. What I would suggest you guys do, I want to give you something here. Go to my channel. Um, it's going to be uh, shockanow.net, right there. Shockanow.net. And when you go there, you're going to see a link. Let's go there right now. You're going to see a link here that says errors and lies of evolution exposed and a few reasons why I left atheism and resources for leaving atheism. Click that and start climbing the mountain of truth. Um, also, go into our chat room. I'm going to go there right now. Click enter chat room. There's two chat rooms. Chat room one is the one you usually find me in. Check this out. There's already people in there. Isn't this awesome? We got 17 people in the chat room right now uh, talking. You can go to the chat room and you can learn about why atheism is not true and why Christianity is true. So listen, guys, as you're climbing this mountain of truth, remember when you get there, the Christians are already going to be there and they're going to say, hey, what took you so long? All right, you can turn in your Bible this morning to the book of Psalms, Psalm 14. I'm going to do something a little bit different today, see how this goes. We're going to look at a couple verses, but mostly I have a lot of scripture here I want to cover, so I'm really going to, I have it typed out, so I'm just going to go flying through it. But today I want to talk about the fruits of atheism. Okay, so Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Turn back to Psalm 53. We're going to see a very similar thing here. Psalm 53, verses 1 through 3. It says here, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are gone altogether, or they are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. A couple interesting things there. Notice it says that they go back. All right? I know uh, Ruckman has a good statement, back to the Bible or back to the jungle. The progress that modern society thinks that they're doing, we're going forward. No, it's actually they're going backward. They're reverting back to the law of the jungle is what they're doing. And an atheist that does not believe in God is going back. They're not moving forward. And you say, well, you know, I think some atheists are good. It's not what the Bible says. And God says of an atheist that they are a fool. 
And it's not that they say that, you know, they understand that there is no God. They say in their heart. And out of the heart is where evil thoughts and abominations come from. And, you know, I've, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this guy, this shooter down in Arizona was an atheist. They are corrupt. And it, it amazes me. I've heard even people that are, are decent commentators, and they don't want to stay on that subject. Well, he was an atheist, you know, Some and some atheists aren't too bad. No, he's an atheist. That's why he did what he did. If he believed in God, if he had faith in Jesus Christ, he wouldn't have done that. Okay? That's just the way it is. Atheists are corrupt. But you have two types of atheists. Okay? You have professing atheists, which a lot of people, you know, that's growing more and more. You have this Dawkins guy, Richard Dawkins, I think his name is. And he's a professing atheist, probably the most popular one. And their whole thing is they want to justify their sin. That's why they act like they're atheists. Okay, none of them, you know, really truly believe that there is no God. Okay, that you can't really believe that, but you believe these people will profess it simply because they want to do away with sin. They don't like being judged. So you have professing atheists. That's the first type of atheist. The second type of atheist is the majority of people today, and that's a practicing atheist. They live without reference to God. They live like they don't believe in God. Now, many of them will profess to believe in God, but in works, they deny Him. That's going to be the majority of people that you have. So, what we're going to do today, and this is going to be kind of a different study, um, kind of a study to kick atheism, but also, this is the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Now, what's the number one attack on the King James Bible from all... Christians, the lost world doesn't attack the King James Bible very much. They usually respect it. But Christians, what do they say about the King James Bible? It's full of errors. It's imperfect. No. It's not. It's, yeah. It needs to be updated. Yeah. It's archaic. Okay? We can't understand it anymore. Well, here on the 400th anniversary, I'm going to show you that it's exactly up to date and that the King James Bible will line up with exactly what's going on in the world, will explain the situation and oftentimes attack the problem. So that's what we're going to go uh, through. I'm going to read a bunch of news articles, and there's a bunch of scriptures I'm going to cover, so this is going to be a little bit different. There's not going to be a lot of time to turn to the scriptures. You can try if you can get there, but I'm, I have them typed out here, so I'm just going to fly through this because there's a lot to cover. Uh, we're going to see how the old archaic King James Bible judges the atheists and the lost world. Okay? So we have article number one. Uh, 20 shocking new economic records that were set in 2010. Now, I'm not going to read all of these, but number one, an all-time record of 2.87 million U.S. households received a foreclosure filing in 2010. 2.87 million households. Almost 3 million people had were given foreclosure notices. Number two, the number of homes that were actually repossessed reached 1 million for the first time ever during 2010. Uh, number six here, back in 1970, 25% of all jobs in the United States were manufacturing jobs. Today, only 9% of the jobs in the United States are manufacturing jobs, which is to be, or which is believed to be a new record low. Before I go on here, you can turn to 1 Timothy 6. We're going to go there in, in just a minute. Um, but I just want to read a couple more quotes here. Number nine, government spending continues to set new all-time records. In fact, at the moment, the U.S. government is spending, listen to this, this is insane, approximately $6.85 million every minute. Almost $7 million a minute is what our government is spending right now. Now, you can say, well, you know, times have been bad in the past, you know, and, and it's been bad. In the past. It was never like this. There has never been a government on this earth that has spent $7 million every minute. Never. It's, it's just nuts. Um, number of Americans on food stamps surpassed 43 million in 2010. Let's see here. According to the... FDIC, 157 banks failed during 2010. Um, this one here is good, too. Americans now owe more than 
$881 billion on student loans. <laughs> and, and of course, our national debt passed $14 trillion this year. So you say, well, what, that, what does that have to do with the Bible? Well, First Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Now that's kind of rough, but that's really all you need. Um, verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Now, if you jump down to verse 17 there, it says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. That's what the Bible has to say about money. You say, what does, this, what does this have to do with atheism? Well, the very lowest dollar bill that we have, right down there in Latin, and I'm not going to get into all the conspiracy stuff, so don't worry about it, but Novus Ordo Seclorum means new order without God. Okay? They're announcing we're going to create a secular society. It's right there. Say, uh, you know, back 1933 was when that thing was put on your dollar bill. So you have people, God blesses this nation, and in the early 1900s, 1933, they start saying, we don't need God anymore. We're going to do things our way. So that's what happens when you have people that do not believe in God. People that don't hold the Bible as their authority, they'll start to get very corrupt and start stealing money. And that's where we're at right now. Okay, article number two. And this is going to be, you know, this message too is a, a good condemnation against the world. If you love the world, you are you need to wake up to some of this stuff. I mean, things are so insane right now. You're going to see it through this study. But things are so insane. I don't know why anybody would want to stick around down here. We should be wanting to see the Lord come back, wanting to leave and go be with the Lord. I mean, there was a, a brother I saw on the internet and he put up a message and he, and he said, if you're not looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back soon, you're wicked. And there were people that were offended, Christians that were offended, you know. Oh, why would you say that? I don't think it's that bad right now. Just incredible. But let's continue on here. Number two, uh, second article here. Romanian witches use spells to protest new taxes. Angry witches are using cat excrement and dead dogs to cast spells on the president and government who are forcing them to pay taxes. And president, I can't pronounce his name, isn't laughing it off. The president and his aides wear purple on Thursdays, allegedly to ward off evil spirits. 21st century in Romania. You know, this isn't back in the Middle Ages or something. Um, magic in Romania is no laughing matter. Cent Centuries-old superstitions are rife and are tolerated even by the Orthodox Church, to which more than four-fifths of Romanians belong. In 2009, the loser in Romania's presidential race, Mircea Giona, and his wife claimed he was subjected to attacks of negative energy by this other person's aides during a crucial debate in which he performed poorly. And it goes on, and they talk about all this stuff. It's just incredible. Politicians casting spells and counter spells and things in a modern society. Just amazing. And uh, this is also kind of interesting. There's a They interviewed one of these witches, and she says, My curses always work. She cackled in a smoky voice. She sat next to her wood-burning stove surrounded by potions, charms, holy water, and ceramic pots. <laughs> Holy word. Yeah, I don't know. She might have, well, orthodox. Most of them are orthodox there. Uh, it's just interesting because, you know, you have uh, Second Chronicles chapter 
33, verses 1 and 2 says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Second Chronicles 33, verse 6 says, And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Going on today. Oh, the Bible's not scientific. It's right there. Oh, it has this weird stuff in it. It's going on today. You know? There's no reason to, to get rid of the King James Bible. Uh, you can turn next to Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read another article here. Uh, article number 3. Queen Elizabeth II tried to get utility bills subsidized by government program for low-income residents. <laughs> uh, unable to keep up with rising utility costs at Buckingham Palace, Queen Elizabeth II was once sought a handout to help pay palace heating bills from a government program that subsidizes heating costs for the poor. <laughs> government ministers considered slipping her the funds, but eventually rebuffed the Queen's request to avoid adverse publicity. <laughs> According to the report, the Queen's bill skyrocketed 50% to more than $1.5 million in 2004, and that says that she makes $60 million a year. $60 million a year, and she can't afford $1.5 million in utility bills. What's that have to do with Scripture? Well, Mark chapter 10, verse 23 through 25 says, And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answering, answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. doesn't say that have riches says it trust in riches. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus is being sarcastic there, by the way. He's actually saying a needle. Okay, it doesn't mean a fence. You know, don't don't fall for that nonsense. You know. Yeah, a hole in the wall or the thing. Yeah, it means an actual needle. Okay. He's using a sarcastic way to, to say it's you know, impossible. Okay, we say, what's the kingdom of God? Romans fourteen seventeen says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I wonder how much righteousness, peace, and joy the Queen of England has right now. Hmm. Doesn't have the kingdom of God. Ecclesiastes five ten says, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. And uh, it's kind of interesting because the man that wrote that, King Solomon, was a lot richer than qu the Queen of England. And yet he wasn't satisfied. Hmm. Maybe the Bible's right after all. Okay, continuing on here, we're going to see more fruits of atheism. And again, you say, well, how's that atheism? Well, that's practicing atheism. You know, if she feared God, if she really, you know, knew the Bible, would she be worried about you know, heating this huge palace or something? I mean, is that really something that we should be spending our time with down here? It's ridiculous. Having a place that it costs one and a half million dollars to heat. That doesn't make much sense. Aren't there some churches that... Yeah, well, you get into the big churches, you know. Um, article number four. Uh, this is a World Net Daily article. Under God, dropped from pledge on house floor. And then it goes into, um, there was a woman, Betty McCollum, Democrat in Minnesota, surprise, surprise, and she was supposed to give the Pledge of Allegiance, and she left out under God. And she did it twice, on two different occasions. And they go into the, the publicity, her publicity person, and, and oh, it was a, it was a accident. She just was nervous, and she left it out, you know, by accident. Mm-hmm. The same thing two different times. And she left it out by accident. Okay. And uh, Obama also, when he g gave the Pledge of Allegiance a couple of times here, he leaves out under God. And 
the Declaration of Independence, he left out um, all men are endowed by their creator. He left out by their creator. He took that out. And it's interesting here, His uh, the PR guy said, somebody asked him, the reporter here says, twice in recent weeks the president has quoted from the Declaration of Independence and has omitted the Declaration's reference to rights endowed by their creator. Why did he omit this part of the Declaration? And here's what the guy says. Now this is perfect political lying he says, I haven't seen the comments, Lester, but I can assure you the president believes in the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Does he believe in God? Didn't say that. He said he believes in the Declaration of Independence. Now, that should be some cause for concern if you know the Bible. Because when you have political leaders that start forsaking God and they don't want to say God's name... That's bad. That's real bad. And uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, I'll read that quick here. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They can't say, oh, oh we didn't know about God. Yeah, they did. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Okay? It's right there. Again, the Bible's right. Um, and it's interesting, too, by the way. I do believe in Romans chapter 13. God will allow these people to be put into power. Okay? They are, they are ordained of God. And even a corrupt, rotten ruler, it's a reflection of the people, what the people want. And if you want to do that, God will say, go ahead. If that's the kind of leader you want ruling you, he's all yours. Have a good time. <laughs> and uh, But I will say this. Even if they're ordained of God, they're not invincible. And even a lot of corrupt politicians in the past would refer to God. Okay, And that's the kind of thing that you need to do if you're a corrupt politician. When you start messing around like this, like this Obama administration, this is probably the first administration ever that is so openly anti-God, you know, anti-Bible, anti-Christian. They're they're bad. I mean, they're very bad. He doesn't even try to pretend to be a Christian. You know, he does, but I mean, he's it's bad. You need to be careful. They're not invincible. And I'm going to show you that uh, while he might be proud, he's certainly not. Um, Without fear. Uh, the next article here. Coconut re coconuts removed from trees in preparation for Barack Obama's India trip. <laughs> Mr. Obama will arrive in India on Saturday for the first leg of an Asian tour. But as well as the usual sec security measures that come with welcoming a visiting dig dignitary, Indian authorities have decided to go one step further by removing all natural threats to the president as well. All coconuts around the city's Gandhi Museum, one of Mr. Obama's stops in the cities, are being taken down. <laughs> Why is he worried about a bunch of coconuts? Is he living in fear? Hmm. Isaiah chapter 33, verses 13 through 16. If you want to go there real quick. I'm going to start reading a while. It says, Hear, hear ye that are far off, what I have done, and ye that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Nobody. Verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions that shaketh his hands from the holding of bribes that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. People won't be poisoning him. God will protect a good ruler. Even a ruler that's lost. If they are upright, if they are doing right, God will protect somebody like that. But you start having these hypocrites that take bribes, that don't walk uprightly, that are bloody killers, they live in fear. 
And a lot of these presidents, it's amazing. Look at them when they go into the office of president and look at them when they come out. It looks like they've aged 10 years and it's only been four years of time. Those guys live in fear. Say, so you want to be president of the United States? No, <laughs> not at all. I don't want to live in fear like that. There's no way. I mean, removing the coconuts from trees because he's afraid coconuts are going to fall on his head. You know, wow, what a brave leader. Um, anyhow here, let's continue on. The next story, uh, the number of federal workers earning $150,000 or more a year has soared tenfold in the past five years and doubled since President Obama took office. USA Today analysis finds. Um, uh, let's see what else I want to read here. And again, just the lying, double-tongued, you know, politicians here. It's just amazing how corrupt things are. The again, the press, the PR woman here in this case, Jessica Clement, government affairs director at the Federal Managers Association, says the government's official pay analysis shows that federal workers earn less than private workers for comparable jobs. Still, she says managers are willing to give up next year's raise if it will help the country bounce back. They're willing to make the sacrifice. Uh -huh. They'll make their 150000 They just won't take their raise for next year. Right. Okay. Just incredible. Uh, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 2 says, For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. Uh, Proverbs 28, verse 6 says, Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. All we want to make 150000 Go ahead. <laughs> you want to do that? You want to live in, without reference to God? You want to, I mean, the conscience of these people to, to be voting themselves pay raises like this and just, just raping this country, destroying the country, and they know it, and they don't care. They live without reference to God, okay? Pro practicing atheism. Now, here's another one that's very interesting. You know, I, I heard a, a, a theory recently that, you know, there's this, this thing going around, you know, why isn't America mentioned in Bible prophecy? Well, because America is going to be destroyed, like it or not. Mm -hmm. But I've heard people say that America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy because America joins with Israel and is counted as Israel. I mean, that's a bunch of nonsense, <laughs> you know, just ridiculous. And, you know, it's just incredible. I'm going to show you how strong our country is here. Okay, and, you know... I'm an American, whatever, you know, and people get mad at me and stuff, you know, well, like it or leave it. Well, I'm going to leave it eventually here. Uh, someday I'm going to hear come up hither and I'm going to leave. Um, MSNBC, one in five Americans had mental illness in 2009. Chicago, more than 45 million Americans or 20% of U.S. adults had some form of mental illness last year and 11 million had a serious illness u.s government researchers reported on thursday and these are the ones that are going to the doctor think about that <laughs> i mean you know we're not doing that good all right um and this is interesting here young adults aged 18 to 25 had the highest level of mental illness at 30 percent while those aged 50 and older had the lowest hmm now, is that a strong nation? The only people that are mentally well are those that are 50 and older. And the ones 18 to 25 have the highest level of mental illness. I mean, that's incredible. This isn't a, a strong nation. Um, and it's found here, and here's another statistic, 14.8 million Americans have major depression in 2009. But are they turning to God? No. They're down, they're depressed, they're sorrowful. You know, a lot of them are, are not only thinking about suicide, but carrying it out, but they aren't turning to God. What's going on? It's incredible. Again, practicing atheism. All right. What's the scripture? Luke chapter 12, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 21. 
Luke chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. Then he said unto them, then said he unto them, excuse me, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Fearful. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah 59, 7 through 8 says, Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths, where whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. The course of the world is crooked. It's not straight. Okay, it's all over the place. They're just they whatever their thoughts are, it's only evil continually. Okay, and they don't know peace. That's why mental illness is just surging right now. And you say, Oh, I think it's gonna get better. I think we're gonna bring America back. You know, the Constitutional Republic's gonna be restored. You're out of your mind. It's not coming back. Here's a newsweek from uh November of two thousand ten. It's a picture of Obama posing like Kali, the Hindu god of, of, or goddess, excuse me, of hell. And it says, Obama, god of all things. And it shows him, you know, his one hand, he's got the six arms on each side, and the one's holding the globe, and the other's holding a helicopter, money, housing, oh, a, a dove, a white dove, you know, for peace. He's a peaceful man. And uh, the other one's a... a What's the thing that you use to listen to somebody's heart? Stethoscope. Stethoscope. Couldn't think of it. But, you know, here he's, he's allowing himself to be called God of all things. Now, that's very dangerous. Uh, Acts chapter 12, verses 21 through 24 says, And upon a set day Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. Doesn't everybody say that Obama is just a great speech? presenter you know he gives good speeches <laughs> yeah i don't i don't really think he does but a lot of people do but uh verse 22 says and the people gave a shout saying it is the voice of a god and not of a man and immediately the angel of the lord smote him because he gave not god the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost you better be careful when you start saying i am god that's dangerous it's one thing to say i'm a christian when you're not but when you start saying, I'm God, that's bad. You know, that's real bad. But it's interesting here. It says in Acts 12, 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Sometimes these wicked people, when they get taken down, the word of God grows and is multiplied because the Bible says this stuff happens. So God gets the glory through it. This one here is interesting too. Um, another MSNBC article, it says, A Scottish church allows hymns instruments for first time in 160 years. Uh, there are few of us who believe it is sinful to sing hymns, they say. Um, they are allowed to quote hymns and they can speak them, but they say singing them is unacceptable. You're not allowed to sing the hymns. And it's interesting because it's kind of like if these people just study the Bible, I know what they're trying to do, but I'll show you the danger of just taking parts of the Bible. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Ah, see, you're only supposed to uh, speak hymns, right? No, you keep reading. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. <laughs> Singing. So, sorry there to the Scottish church. You're supposed to be singing. All right, article number 10. <laughs> I mean, we got the nuts today. I'll tell you what, this is insane. Spanish woman claims she now owns the sun. Uh, a woman, let's see, Angelus... And Halas and Duran 49 told the online edition of Daily El Mundo 
She took the step in September after reading about an American man who had registered himself as the owner of the moon and most planets in our solar system. There was no snag. I backed my claim legally. I am not stupid. I know the law. I did it, but anyone else could have done it. Simply occurred to me first. Duran, who lives in, a, in the town of Salvaterra uh, de Mino, said she now wants to slap a fee on everyone who uses the sun and give half the proceeds to the Spanish government and 20% to the nation's pension fund. She would uh, like to dedicate another 10% to research, another 10% to ending world hunger, and would keep the remaining 10% herself. <laughs> you know, which if you charge everybody in the world's population, there's what, 7 billion, 6 or 7 billion, 10% wouldn't be too bad of a cut. <laughs> Uh, it is time to start doing things the right way. If there is an idea for how to generate income and improve the economy and people's well-being, why not do it, she asked. Okay. Now, can she get away with that? Well, uh, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 13 a while. I'll read a couple other verses here. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19 says, Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun... And the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, should us be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. People worship the sun. Okay, and it's God, by the way, that put them up there. Job 9, verse 7 and 8 says, Which commandeth the sun, speaking about God, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. God controls the sun. Psalm 74, verse 16. The day is thine, and the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Uh, sorry, but you can't take the sun away from its rightful owner. He's not going to give it up. Uh, and I don't care if you have a notarized note. <laughs> Isaiah 13, verses 9 through 11. And this, this I don't know what she's going to do about this. She might have to take God to court. Uh, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, in, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked, the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Hmm. I think she's got a problem yeah, <laughs> coming. Well, well you know? Yeah. And and would again again, would she have done that if she believed in God? If she had a personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ? She wouldn't have been stupid enough to go to the notary public and say she owns the son. I mean, what a bunch of nonsense. That's the fruits of Catholicism, by the way. You got the Catholic Church pretty much controls Spain. Uh, continuing on here, try to get through these things. Uh, courts, the courts have now said in this one state that using another's social security number is not a crime. And they go into the thing of how these poor illegals come here and they just want to have, they just want to use a social security number to get a job or to get a car. So, it's no longer a crime to do that, to take somebody's social security number. If you're an illegal alien, you can do it. You know, If any of us did it, we'd be in trouble. But it's okay for them. And I mean, these are major courts that are, that are saying it's fine. Uh, I won't read a whole lot of the thing here. It says, The most recent judicial body to take on the issue, the Colorado Supreme Court, ruled last month that a man who used his real name but someone else's social security number to obtain a car loan was not guilty of criminal impersonation, overturning convictions by lower courts. Uh, you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, by the way. Here's one that says, uh, this guy's National Immigrant Justice Center in Chicago. He says, an immigrant who uses a false social security number to get a job doesn't intend to harm anyone, and it makes no sense to spend our tax dollars to imprison them for two years. Yeah. But what's the Bible have to say about this kind of stuff? Ecclesiastes 8, 11 through 13 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, 
Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. You have to execute judgment against people that do wrong, and you need to do it quickly, or else more and more of them will say, well, we can get away with that now. And as a Christian, you're not supposed to look at that and say, wait, well, if they're getting away with it, maybe I could use it for... No, you don't do that. You fear God, even if people can get away with crimes. Hey, if, if law and order breaks down and there'd be some kind of a looting thing and people are going into a store and stealing things, as a Christian, you don't say, well, they're doing it, so I guess I can do it too. No, you fear God, you say, I'm not going in there. There's no way. I'm not going to steal somebody's social security number. I'm not going to disobey the law even if everybody else is doing it. Not going to happen. Okay? Now I'm going to actually show you an atheist thing that's going on here. Uh, this is up in Canada. Christ meets Bigfoot. More irreverent atheist ads set to hit can Canadian cities. And uh, they have a thing here on the side of this bus. A sign on the side of the buses in the city. I'll read it. And it says... Uh, uh, the atheist group behind last year's controvers controversial bus ads suggesting there's probably no God is rolling out a provocative new set of posters on buses across the country that places Allah beside Bigfoot and Christ beside physics. Or psychics, I'm sorry. The new poster uh, bears the slogan, Extraordinary Claims Require Extraordinary Evidence. And then below it has uh, Allah, Bigfoot, UFOs, Homeopathy, Zeus, Psychics, Christ. So they just throw Christ in with all that stuff. And then, and then you know, the, what they say about it is just ridiculous. It says here, We're not here to mock people who believe in these claims, he said. Yeah, come on. He said, Scientists have made extraordinary statements to explain evolution, but their beliefs are backed by evidence. <laughs> <laughs> no, they aren't. Mm -hmm. You know, um... It says here, homeopathy, miracles, and religious claims, these, those are at least as extraordinary, but where's the evidence? Plenty of it. They just don't want to see it. Present the evidence and we'll be happy to come along for the ride and endorse those beliefs, he said. No, they won't. The previous ads, which ran beginning in January of 2009, said, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life, and appeared in Toronto, Ottawa, Calgary, and Montreal for about a month in each city. Notice it said, they said in their ad, there's probably no God. Hmm. What's the matter there? Can't be definite about it? And what's the thing? There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Ah, there you go. There's your professing atheists. Why are they doing it? Why are they saying there's no God? Because they want to sin. Enjoy your life. That's what they want to do. And just to show you how bad Canada is, and I, I know a lot of people up in Canada, and they say that things are pretty bad up there. It's hard to find a good church. The United Church of Canada, the country's largest Protestant denomination, countered last year's atheist ad campaign with newspaper ads of their own. And they said, here's their counter, the big Protestant church up there. There's probably a God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. That's their counter? Isn't that amazing? And uh, they, they talk to the one of the guys here, and he says, Dialogue between people of all faiths is always welcome, provided that the means to, uh, to do so do not contravene Canada's hate speech laws or promote violence toward any identifiable group. And uh, here's an interesting statistic. About a quarter of Canadians said they didn't believe in any God in a 2008 poll. A quarter. 25% Canadians. And from hearing from you know brothers and sisters up in Canada, that's right. Might even be a little bit low. <laughs> uh, just incredible. A quarter of the population. Uh, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9 says, Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Proverbs chapter 1, 24 through 27 says, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, 
but ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity, I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, uh, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. I read down to verse 33 there. Okay. So, continuing on here. A couple more to go. Um, this is the United Nations. Okay. It says here they they just had a thing down in Cancun, down in Mexico. Cristina Figueres, however you say that, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, invoked the ancient jaguar goddess Ixchul in her opening statement to delegates gathered in Cancun, Mexico, noting that Ixchul was not only goddess of the moon, but also the goddess of reason, creativity, and weaving. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. She's a basket weaver, too. Uh, May she inspire you because today you are gathered in Cancun to weave together the elements of a solid response to climate change using both reason and creativity as your tools. Uh, excellencies, the goddess Ixchul would probably tell you that a tapestry is the result of the skillful, uh, skillful interlacings of, of many threads, said Figueres, who hails from Costa Rica, and stated her greetings in Spanish before switching to English. I am convinced that 20 years from now we will admire the policy tapestry that you have woven together and think back finally to Cancun and the inspiration of Ixchul. They can't say Jesus' name, but they can invoke a jaguar goddess that weaves. I mean, what do you have? You have practicing atheists. If you'd say, hey, do you believe in God? Oh, sure. You know, and you'd have to say which one, <laughs> you know, uh, or ones. But this is all going on today. I mean, they're they're looking up old ancient pagan deities and things like that and worshiping them today. And the United Nations, you know, it's just incredible. Just weird. But Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 25 talks about the thing there. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, I'd say she qualifies, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. It's right there. Okay, and then, of course, 1 Corinthians 10, 19, and 20, well, I'm not going to read it, but it talks about that the Gentiles sacrifice things to idols. And in verse 10, or verse 20 goes on to say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. So this Ixchel or whatever is a devil. Okay? And that's what the United Nations is, is praying to. Can't pray to Jesus Christ, but you can pray to devils. Just incredible. Uh... Next article. Most evangelicals believe good people are heaven-bound. The majority of Protestants and evangelicals believe that good people and people of other religions can go to heaven, according to author David Campbell. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about um, 83% of evangelical Protestants agree that good people of other religions can go to heaven. It says, simply put, interlocking social network networks allow believers to accept tenets of other faiths. Richard Land, president of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, says um, that he lamented that more evangelicals are being taught the doctrine of universalism. It's emphasized from the pulpit. It's emphasized in the seminaries, he declared. Uh, that universalism is the theological doctrine that all people will eventually be saved despite a relationship with Christ. And that's being taught today. But before you get all excited about uh, um, this guy, the Southern Baptist, coming out and, and rebuking this thing, 
It goes on to say that he said it is possible for Methodists, Baptists, Lutherans, and Catholics to follow the tenets of their faiths and have salvation in Jesus Christ. But he said that the same is not true for Buddhists, Muslims, and Mormons. So, Catholics. Got the head of the Southern Baptist Convention saying Catholics are okay. Pretty amazing. Titus 1.16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Watch out for this modern church stuff. Some of these people, I don't believe they're saved. They profess that they know God, but in works and their beliefs they deny Him. Okay? And of course that's prophesied. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 talks about the falling away first that would come. And uh, 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So you're not to fellowship with these people. Okay, you should witness to them, but you shouldn't be fellowshipping with them. If you're in a big modern church where they believe that other people, you know, Buddhists and whatever can be saved, you need to get out of that place. Okay, continuing on here. Former President Jimmy Carter believes the U.S. is ready to elect a gay president in the near future. I think the entire population has come tremendous strides forward in dealing with the issue of gays, Carter said in an interview with the website Big Think. I don't know about the next election, but I think in the near future, because step by step we have realized that the issue of homosexuality has the same adverse and progressive elements as when we dealt, dealt with the race issue. He went on to say, I would say that the country is getting acclimated to a president who might be female, who might obviously now be black, and who might as well be a gay person. Remember what I said earlier? Or rather what the Bible said? They are all gone backward. But they think that they're going forward. And you think God's going to put up with this? Absolutely not. Um, Isaiah 3, 9 through 11 says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. Woe unto their soul. It doesn't say woe unto their body. The body can die, but the soul can go to heaven. But not for these people. Woe unto their soul. Why? Because it goes down to hell. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. So, they're not going to get away with it. Another one here. A 13-year-old boy busted in public school for illegal marker possession. <laughs> December 22nd. You know, a couple days... Before Christmas here, it says a 13-year-old boy was arrested Friday for using a permanent marker while in class at his Oklahoma City Middle School, a violation of an obscure city ordinance. The 50-year-old teacher uh, goes on, she basically caught the boy using a marker. And so being instead of being a normal human being, instead of having love for the children that she's teaching, she calls the police. The police came... Uh, and uh, it says here, Compost reported that he allowed Woodside, a 7th grade math teacher, to sign a citation against the boy who was then transported to the Community Intervention Center, a juvenile holding facility. A police sergeant subsequently booked the marker into the property room. That's a sign of a sick society. That's not normal. If a boy has a marker and you can't handle that as a teacher, you got to call the police. You know what they should have done? They should have arrested the teacher for wasting the policeman's time. But instead, they take the boy into, the, into custody over a marker? Is this the kind of society that's right with God? No. It's a, it's a mad society. It's a sick society. You know, Lester Roloff said a, a thing which is part of my uh, mind now, and that's that America is an insane asylum run by the inmates. Amen. Yeah. Public school is just insane. Uh, and of course you have the scripture there. Matthew 24 verse 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. What happened to the 
teachers having love for their children. Saying, these kids are here, I, I have a love for them, I want to teach them. No, they get weird. They do weird stuff like that. Here's a, another one about public school. More and more, you need to get your kids out of public school. It's a bad place. Um, Brookline School is now saying permission slips won't be necessary for students to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Uh, Geraldo Martinez, the school's principal, initially said the permission slips were sent to encourage parents to have a discussion with their kids about the pledge. He sent home permission slips, that they had to sign permission slips for their kids to be allowed to, to say the Pledge of Allegiance. He was trying to get rid of the Pledge of Allegiance. So now we have, you know, basically, I don't, I don't know if he's an illegal alien or not, but the point is he comes to the schools and he says... Don't say the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, what's in part of the Pledge of Allegiance? One nation under God. A lot of people are offended by that now. They don't want their kids saying it. See, it's bad. That's real bad. You know, to have a public school dictating morals like that, just ridic ridiculous. Uh, Psalm 10 verse 4 says the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God God is not in all his thoughts so again you see that and one more kick against the public schools the National Education Association recently celebrated a uh, event here with drag queen teachers teachers that are transvestites essentially this isn't some gay organization. This is the government, the federal government, saying that we celebrate teachers that are men that want to dress up like women. You want your children being taught by that? And I saw one. I, there's one locally here. There was an article where some male teacher now is dressing up like a woman. And God's going to put up with a nation like this? You say we're going to join with Israel and be God's nation? Are you kidding me? It's insane. It's just disgusting. Matthew 18, verse 6 and 7 says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Stuff has to happen. It's unfortunate. Okay, just a few more here and then we're done. Um, here's another one. That, you know, people, oh, well, times are bad in the past, you know. And, eh. It was never like this. Maybe pre-flood, but things are just getting insane. Uh, Yahoo News, New Jersey police, man seeking a portal to hell stabbed too. <laughs> Union, New Jersey, a man who claimed he was seeking the portal to hell repeatedly stabbed two women early Friday after they noticed misplaced items in their backyard and opened the door to a shed where he was staked out, law enforcement office, officials said. A neighbor jumped the fence after hearing the women screaming and hit the assailant, 25-year-old Morgan Mez, I guess is how you say it, in the head with a baseball bat, ending the attacks. <laughs> Good for him. Uh, the stabbings occurred at around 6 a.m. after the two women, aged 50 and 53, let their dog outside. And, the, you know, it goes on to say about that he was in there, he cleared out all the stuff, he was trying to seek the portal to hell. We're dealing with some very sick individuals nowadays. And it says here that um, they're doing a drug test on him, but that they're basically, he's undergoing a psychological evaluation. And guess what happens if they find that he has a mental sickness? They'll medicate him and put him back out on the street. They don't know how to deal with people that are possessed with devils. I saw a whole report on there was these two sisters over there in the UK and the the one you know they both were running out in front of vehicles getting hit and the police got there to try and help them they'd run back out into the you know road and get hit there were you know it was taking 6 7 8 guys to subdue these women after they'd been run over by tractor trailers you know I mean weird and then they got them to the hospital and, you know, they, they got him out. The one they let out, the other one was in more critical condition. 
the one they let out, she went home with some guy that she met on the street, stabbed him to death, and then she's running down the street with a hammer hitting herself in the face. And some guy tried to stop her, some guy tried to help her, and she took out a, she had a slate shingle from a roof, and she smashed it over the guy's head and took off running again, jumped off a bridge. And you know what they did? They took her into custody, they did psychological evaluation, they said she's mentally sick, she spent a few months, I think it was like 10 months or something in prison, and they put her back out on the street. They don't know how to deal with people that are possessed with devils. Now, you say, well, what's this have to do with Scripture? Well, uh, I'm not going to read all the verses, but you can read Mark chapter 5, the man with an unclean spirit. It says, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Okay, neither could any man tame him. And it's interesting, verse 6 says, and when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, but Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 uh, through 4 says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Verses 7 and 8, the next seal. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And uh, I can tell you right now, the lost world is not prepared for the tribulation that's coming. And if for some reason you're listening to this message, and you're lost, and you think that you're going to make it through that time okay, <laughs> you got another thing coming. It's going to be a bad, bad time. Okay. I think we have four more here, and we're done. Uh, the word mother and father will be removed from U.S. passport applications and replaced with gender-neutral terminology, the State Department says. The words in the old form were mother and father, said Brenda Sprague, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Passport Services. They are now parent one and parent two. Uh, and, of course, gay rights groups are applauding the decision, changing the terms mother and father to the more global term of parents allows many different types of families to be able to go and apply for a passport for their child without feeling like the government doesn't recognize their family, said Jennifer Chrysler, executive director of Family Equity Council. It's interesting because the new versions are doing the same thing. I have done the research. The word father has been hundreds and hundreds of places has been taken out of the newest NIV, the TNIV. It has been. They replace it with parent. Hmm. wonder if it's the same spirit that's leading these gays and these new version translators. Just incredible. And Genesis chapter 6 uh, talks about how that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And you can read the account there in Genesis 6, but it also says, Matthew 24, verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the wicked abominations that were going back before the flood, they're here again. Okay, story number 21 here. A Pennsylvania widow builds a vault, could get corpses back. Why a Lussing, Pennsylvania? It looks like Jean Stevens will be reunited with the two people she loved so much that she wanted them to keep her company after they died. The 91-year-old widow who lived with the embalmed corpses of her husband and twin sister until authorities found out and took them away is hopeful they'll be returned soon. Uh, the coroner, uh, she said, has them up there in the cold box, which makes me shiver. He says they're all right, Gene. You don't have to worry about them. Stevens had dug had their bodies dug up shortly after they died, James in 1999, June in 2009, because she couldn't bear not being able to see them again. She kept her husband on a couch in the garage and her sister in a spare room off the bedroom where I could touch her and look at her and talk to her, Stevens told AP last summer. Death is very hard for me to take, she added. 
Hmm. What's the scripture there? First Thessalonians four thirteen through fourteen. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. She has no hope. For for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Okay? And it goes on to say in this article that she gets letters from people all all over the world saying, you know, that they're for what she's doing. It's a sick society. It's a heathen society. Again, these people live as atheists. They don't live with reference to God. If this woman was saved, she wouldn't be doing this. But that's the fruits of atheism. That's the kind of sick mentality that you're going to see in a society that has collapsed. Just incredible. Now here's kind of a positive one. I'll read this one here. Um, officer won't sign order for troop indoctrination. An army lieutenant colonel has asked to be relieved of command rather than order his troops to go through pro-homosexual indoctrination following the repeal of the policy which required homosexuals to keep silent about their sexual preference. Currently, the commander of a battalion-sized unit in the Army National Guard, the officer also has threatened to resign his commission rather than undergo behavior modification training intended to counter his religious convictions about homosexuality. Amen. Amen. That's a good guy there. And he goes on to say that, I mean, they have his actual letter here that he gave to to his superiors, and he said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna accept these people in, I'm not gonna train my soldiers, and I'm not gonna go through the indoctrination program to be okay with these people. He said, I'm not gonna do it. And it's interesting because he's gonna be retiring, his retirement is coming up in 2012. Now he could just keep his mouth silent and just say, well, you know, I'll just kinda go along with it so I can retire. But he's not doing it. He's coming out and he's saying, I will not do this. It's wrong. It's sin. I'm not doing it. Um, read a scripture here. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. And by the way, if they say that in society in general, that you have to be okay with gays or you're going to go to prison, what's going to be your reaction? If they come to this ministry and say, you can't preach against queers anymore. Or we're going to put you in prison. Well, I guess I'll be in jail then. Because uh, I'm not going to stop preaching against homosexuality. Sodomy. I want to call it homosexuality. Proverbs chapter 29, verses 25 through 27 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked. I bet you the queers out there hate this soldier. I bet they can't stand him. Um, and he said here, Very few soldiers are fine with open homosexuals in the service, said the officer. Uh, as previously reported by World Net Daily, some experts predict as many as a quarter of Americans in military service will resign or leave earlier than planned because of the advent of open homosexuality. Nearly half of the Marine Corps respondents to the Pentagon survey said they would consider leaving the service earlier than planned. Boy, we're going to have a strong military now, aren't we? <laughs> half of the Marines are saying we're out of here, you know. A lot of the army's saying, no, we're not going to put up with this. So, this is incredible. And again, do you fear God? It's right there. Okay. Um, two more and then we're finished. Article 23. Obama plays golf more than professional golfer. Okay, he's been playing more rounds of golf and is since being in office than this professional golfer, John Kim, a producer for PGA.com. Okay, Second uh, Timothy three four traders, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. A nation is falling apart, and the leader goes out and says, "I'm going to play games." Uh, article number twenty four. Uh, near record high, see religion losing influence in America. 
Princeton, New Jersey. Seven in ten Americans say religion is losing its influence on American life. One of the highest responses in Gallup's 53 history of asking this question, and significantly higher than in the first half of the past decade. Okay. And back in 1957, 69% of Americans said religion was increasing in its influence. So more and more you have people saying religion is, is falling apart. And they're right. Uh, while almost all me measures show that Americans were more religious in the 1940s and 1950s than in recent decades, Americans to be uh, Americans appear to be as personally religious now as they were in the late 70s and 80s. Churches and synagogue membership, on the other hand, has drifted downward in a more steady fashion. Um, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Isaiah 1, 4 uh, and 5 says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Can you see it there? Why should you be stricken any more? You will be, you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Did America turn to God after 9-11? No. Got worse. Any kind of horrible, terrible thing that happens, all the storms that are hitting and the, and the plagues and the economy falling apart, and yet Americans are not turning to the Lord. You say, well, yeah, but you know, I think that we might come out of it because after all, we're not destroyed yet. Well, I'm going to tell you the reason why we aren't destroyed yet. Isaiah 1.9 says, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. That's why. Now let me just give you a little prophecy for the future. Isaiah 10 verses 5 and 6 says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. God will actually raise up lost heathen and send them in against a nation that used to be godly. And right now, China and Russia both have their sights on this country. And I'm going to tell you something right now. We're not going to win. America's not going to win against a nation like China and Russia, two nations. They would wipe us off the, the map. There's just no way. I mean, we got a queer army that, you know, <laughs> that half of them, they can't even do, you know, you told me about they can't even do jumping jacks because it throws their, their shoulders out of socket, you know, and we're going to defeat China. It's not going to happen. God's done with America. Now, how should a Christian live in this wicked time? First of all, Understand that this world is lost. You're not going to get this world back. Anybody that tells you that is lying to you. Get ready to leave. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming soon, very soon. Number two, make sure that you don't get caught in the downward trend. Backward, as the Bible says. It's not. There's no such thing as progressive Christianity. It's backsliding. The Bible never says, never says that there's going to become a better form of Christianity right before the Antichrist shows up. It's a falling away. There will come a falling away first. You fall backward, back to the jungle. Anybody tells you that Christianity is getting better and better, they're lying. Amen. They are lying to you. Don't believe it. Okay, number three, do what you can, but don't fall into the trap of comparing your ministry to the ministry that was going on a hundred years ago. We're not living in the same times anymore. The people of today have been destroyed by television and movies. I mean, how many people a hundred years ago saw rape, murder, robbery, you know, uh, drugs, uh, you know, the, yeah, perversion of every kind. And yet most of us here today, if we're honest, we would say, yeah, we've seen TV or movies at some point in time that was very inappropriate. We've seen people get killed. Oh, it's just pretend. Yeah, but the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay? Satanic music. All forms of satanic music. And I don't just mean rock and roll that's talking about perversion or something. I mean 
there are people that are actually coming right out and they're openly satanic, you know, in the rock and roll industry. And how many of these people that we witness to out there on the streets, how many of them are listening to that stuff every day? You know, how many times were, were, were we out going door to door and you'd hear some vehicle go by with rap music blaring? What is it? It's satanic. It's back to the jungle. It's those people there. It gets the adrenaline up. It, you know, they're not ready to receive the Lord at that point. They're being indoctrinated into this stuff. They're watching movies at night, then walking around the whole day with satanic music. Okay? Pornography and sex perversion. I just did a message this past week on, uh, during the week on uh, pornography, the pornography epidemic. It's between 70 to 90% of professing Christians, according to different polls. 70 to 90 percent. How many people out there? And, and that's the professing Christians. What about the lost? And they're raised up on this stuff with the TV, with the music, and perversion. And you think that they're going to be open to the things of the Lord? You think that they're going to want to give up that life? And, and you have to give that up, by the way. It's repentance. We talked about last week. Public school indoctrination and evolution philosophy. We have had generations of people that have been brainwashed into that way of thinking, that there is no God. They've been brainwashed into it. Drugs, prescription, and illegal. And food additives. You know, I mean, a, a brother over in England just sent me a video about all the food additives and the preservatives and everything. It's incredible. We're not dealing with the same kind of people when we go out and witness as Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody preached to we're dealing with different people now. And wicked church practices. The stuff that goes on under professing Christianity today was nowhere 100 years ago. It was nowhere 60 years ago. The kind of things. And so people, the lost world, they see that stuff. They don't want to be part of it. You know, it's a joke. And of course, you know, there are some that do want to be part of it because it's fleshly. It's worldly. Okay, we're not dealing with the same amount of people. Don't expect the same results when you go out and you witness to people. It's just not going to be there. Uh, two more places and then we're done. Second Timothy. You can turn in your Bible here. I don't have this one typed out. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 14. I think this is one of my new favorite verses <laughs> such a good verse it says but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them man that is so profound the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of have you learned about the king james bible continue in it have you learned about the right way of salvation where sinners are called to repentance continue in it don't let people brainwash you into thinking that you're believing a false gospel or something. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is coming back? Continue in it. Because I'm going to tell you, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. These stories that I read today, these articles, are just they just happened in the last couple of months. What's it going to be like within the next couple of months? I mean, it's it's almost a daily basis now that these weird things are happening weather and, and violence and, and just this world's getting insane very quickly. And why? Because they rejected God and they rejected God's book. Jump over to verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. We'll stop there. Are you going to depart from the Lord? You will if you don't continue in the things which you've learned, which thou hast learned and been assured of. A lot of people are going to back off. A lot of them already have. A lot of Christians that used to be Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing, soul-winning, pre-trib rapture, they're going to the modern rock and roll churches. Why? Because they love the present world. They didn't want to keep standing. And I can't, I can't hammer this thing through enough. You're going to have to stand. And there's going to be more and more and more people. You know, I would love to have, you know, lots and lots more people come in here. But to be very honest with you, I don't think we're going to get that many people. The 
Bible-believing Christians, the small remnant, is spread out. God doesn't want us congregating together and all moving to some special place. And now we have a Christian Mecca that you can come to and learn and all this. God doesn't want that. He wants us spread out so we don't get wiped out. But you're going to have to continue in the things that you've learned. And if you don't, if you're going to love the present world, you're going to want to fit in, and you're going to get wiped out. But now to the atheists, I'll say this in closing. Revelation 10, verse 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The atheists say, well, show us proof. We want to see evidence for God's existence. It's coming. And you say, oh, well, that'll be good. No, it won't. No, it won't. The, the atheists are saying, we want proof. The proof that's coming is going to be horrifying. It's going to be the worst time period in history. The Bible says that over half of the world's population is going to be destroyed. How, how close is it, are we to that? How soon is this going to happen? Very soon. Very, very soon. So that's it for this morning. Don't don't fall for this modern politically correct thing that atheism is okay and I don't want to rip on them or anything. The Bible calls them fools. And we should be very firm with them. You know, they are fools. So continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of. You know, it's it's not... I just want to say one other thing here before I close. It's not that you continue in the things that you've been taught and never question them. It says continue in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of. You need to check out what you're being taught. Amen. And then you're to continue in it. Amen. And don't back off for anybody. No matter how bad it gets. Don't back off. Are you going to be like that lieutenant colonel in the army that said, I will not submit to this new legislation from the government. I will disobey the orders that come down to me and if it forces me to resign so be it i will not bend to this homosexual legislation are you going to be like that or are you going to love the world and say well maybe i should compromise here and just kind of give in and don't do that don't compromise the lord's coming back soon that's it thank you let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.